All right. Hey, guys. Welcome to Jerry's Live. As always, I'm your host, Amy Gardner Dean. Today, we have a very exciting episode. It is JL157. If you want to see any of the products that we are going to have our special guest show you, um, you'll go to the jerrysartorama.com website. You'll type in that keyword JL157. Excuse me. Oh, keep getting a catch. Um, that will show you all the products we're using today. We have Andrew Cook, a, our very special guest and one of my really awesome friends, live from the West Coast. Andrew works with Savoir Fair, which imports amazing products like Fabriano, Sennelier, and a host of others. And he's going to teach us about how watercolor paper is made today and use some watercolor and brushes and just have an overall awesome time. So, Andrew, hello. It's so cool to hello, see you. Hello, Amy. It is so good to be here. I, I'm really excited. I'm sorry that we don't get to be hanging out in person. I know. Always a blast to be with you. But uh, but I am ever excited to be on Jerry's Live again and get to be here with all of your adoring fans. Uh, so with that, I should get started, right? I should dive right into it. Yes, you have you have awesome things to show us and and uh, maybe a little fun and experimenting to do as well. But the educational stuff that you've prepared, you talked about earlier uh, today and this week, and I think it's going to be really cool because it's going to shed a lot of light on what really goes into making artist quality watercolor paper. It is not as easy as one thinks. It is not. It is not. All right. Well, let me let me tell you uh, a little bit about me. As Amy said, I am Savoir Faire. I'm our director of education. Uh, I am an artist, so I, I really enjoy these products. It's uh, fun for me. I'm a little bit of an art nerd. Uh, I've been in art materials for the last 12 years. And beyond that, I have my degree in art. So I, I just never want to stop talking. I am an artist, so I yes. really enjoy these products. All right, you can hear me? Sorry. Yes. Okay, and I can hear you. Good, good. Uh, all right, so uh, Savoir Faire is a, uh, a company that imports and distributes some really fantastic historical brands, as Amy mentioned, like Fabriano, Sennelier, Raphael, uh, as well as many more. Those are the three that we'll, we'll dive into today. Definitely focusing in on Fabriano, talking a lot about the paper. Uh, and we've been importing these materials into the U.S. for the last 40 years or close to 40 years. Uh, it was started by Maureen Lebrow and Pierre Gadetti, and they started importing into their modest little home in Sausalito. And now we have about 20 people working here uh, just north of San Francisco. And so if you see these things in your local Jerry store, it came through California and then right over to Jerry. So uh, we are happy to make sure that you have it available. So watercolor, there's been a lot of really exciting developments in watercolor and we are gonna talk about those, some of the ones that are specific to Fabriano, Sennelier. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the brands, uh, but first I'm gonna dive into Fabriano. That's, that's where the, the really exciting stuff is happening. So. We'll dive into that. Amy, feel free to jump in and chit chat okay. a little bit as we go. All right. Uh, I, I don't want to be too overwhelming. Uh, I know I've got, I, I like to talk. So it's all okay. Good. That's why we get along. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Fabriano paper is still made in the small town of Fabriano in Italy. Uh, it is. Uh, kind of central in Italy. It's it's not on the coast, but it is near a river. So Fabriano has has used hydropower their entire lives as a company. Uh, and Fabriano has only been there a couple of years. Do you, Amy, do you remember how old they are? Uh, I, I, it was 700 and something years, right? That is right. 756 years this year. So they uh, they have been making paper for over seven centuries. And, and Greenly over seven centuries too. Yes. It's a crazy yes. thing. Yes. Uh, now we think about Fabriano here in the U.S. and it's, you know, it's in a lot of stores, but it's, it's right. in your Jerry stores. It's got a nice big rack, but we don't always think about it 
uh, as, as being a historical brand because it's relatively new to the United States. Right. It has been being used by artists in the United States and abroad for that entire length of time. Uh, I mean, you recognize artists like Michelangelo and Da Vinci. They've done work on Fabriano paper. Uh, contemporary artists that are friends of ours, like Lauren McCracken and Dean Mitchell, are phenomenal watercolorists who are working on Fabriano paper. Uh, and then everybody in between. If we if we dive into even just the 19th and 20th century, we see artists like Francis Bacon, Georgia O'Keeffe, Cy Twombly. Philip Gustin, Andrew Wyeth, Jasper Johns. Uh, I mean, most of these names too are just from one quick search of a single museum. So you can look up Fabriano right. in, in virtually every museum in the world uh, and be able to find artist work on Fabriano paper. Um, it's been a staple in people's studios for that, that whole 756 years. Uh, and there was nothing that, that we really desired to, to uh, completely change, but we did want to take the paper that everybody knows and loves right now and give it to you in its best possible form. So I'm going to tell you a little secret, and it's not going to be a secret for very long, but that is... You're telling us, so... Yes. Not and a secret now, those of you, but we those of you, you're finding out first. You're finding out, well, second, because if you tuned in at the end of last year with Amy and I, then I gave you a little teaser about it. True. But I didn't actually have any in my hand then. Uh, and now I can show you that Fabriano has uh, relaunched, we are relaunching our Fabriano Artistico paper. Uh, so now it's going to have four deckled edges, a new watermark that is quite modest, which we're excited about. <laughs> uh, and a brand new sizing, which is, uh, you know, we took something that we thought was perfect and we made it more perfect. Uh, so we, we can't really go wrong there. No. And make a ton of noise right away. So, so this, now I knew about the paper and I knew about the decals and all that. An update on sizing. Yes. That's, that's kind of exciting. It's very exciting. Uh, I'm, I know I'm jumping around. I have all my notes out, but I will. We'll, That's okay. Uh, I, I want to make sure I hit everything. That the sizing is the most exciting part, in my opinion. I mean, the surface, we're keeping those traditional surface textures that we know and love. So we don't have to worry too much about being jarred. You know, we're not going to get our next right. sheet of paper and go to paint and have, have a completely different experience than we want, but we will have a better experience than we were expecting. Uh, the new sizing. Well, first, let's talk about the old sizing. So right. Fabriano is credited with creating paper sizing, the first paper Western paper sizing. Uh, prior to that, you know, in the, the 1200s, uh, they had created paper in Asia, but it was mostly unsized. Right. So used for very special circumstances, and it would have to be encased and, and kept very carefully because it, it was very prone to damage. Uh, and then come into Fabriano many, many years later in 1264, uh, and they started making Western paper. And with the Western paper, we were able to, to create a sizing that made it much more durable for writing, for painting, for all kinds of purposes. I mean, uh, people used to use Fabriano paper when it was first developed as a, as a form of uh, documentation of transactions, you know, check paper. Uh, before there were things like checks. So if you, it wasn't on Fabriano, then it wasn't considered a legitimate transaction. Uh, so they wanted a durable paper that was going to last. And with that, we created the first paper sizing. Uh, it was animal based at the time, gelatin based, which many papers still, still do that. And that's, that's fine. It's its own thing. Uh, but then many years ago, Still in the 1900s, you know, so in the mid 1900s, Fabriano changed its paper sizing, uh, mo most, if not all of us think, for the better. We created a vegetable based paper sizing, uh, and that allowed the paper surface to feel a little different, to absorb paint a little differently. So it really made the paper stand out as a, as a different kind of paper. Uh, and then from there, we now have this new sizing which instead of being a blend of vegetable-based sizing, 
uh, which we can call also call synthetic sizing. Uh, now it is completely vegetal, vegetable, uh, still vegan, but it's made out of a starch. So you can think of it like potato paper kind of, uh, but it's, it's a starch based sizing. So it, it maintains a really nice, uh, a really nice tooth, a really nice durability. Mm -hmm. And the paint sits on there in such a nice way. It's, uh, it's just, it's a really, really beautiful surface to work on. You know, we just got the first samples here in the U.S. Uh, just a few weeks ago, and I've had a chance to play with it a little bit. And uh, I don't notice a tremendous difference okay. um, from the standpoint of the textural quality. Uh -huh. From the finish, I can notice a little bit of a difference if I'm really paying attention. So for those of you who are in love with the Fabriano as Artistico as it is now, uh, you're still going to love it, if not more. Uh, but for those of you who haven't tried it, now you have a reason to, to go out and try it again. So uh, now we'll talk about how it comes. So Fabriano is available in, a, in just a tremendous array, surfaces and textures, uh, weights, sizes. So we have everything from your normal 140 pound sheets uh, to 300 pound to blocks to rolls. I mean, behind me here, you can see there's a, a roll leaning against the wall and the rolls are just immense. They are 55 inches by 11 yards. Uh, so if you like working big, we have paper for you too. Uh, they, they come in two different colors. And I think earlier when we tested, it was best when I held it up to this camera. So I won't shift cameras yet. Let's see, how's that? Yeah, that's, oh, wow. So, so you can see there's the extra white and the traditional white. Mm -hmm. Uh, and neither of them are using any optical whiteners or bleaches. Uh, it's just a, a kind of a sun bleaching process they use to get that extra white. And the traditional white is just the natural cotton pulp. Uh, they also come in four surface textures. Let's see if I can show that. Really yeah, you can see it. So there's rough. Uh, many of you have heard of rough before, but rough is the roughest surface that you can get. And then we have, we'll keep in order, sorry. You know, this isn't in order. So then we have cold press, which has a nice, a nice tooth to it. Uh, it's, it's a strong tooth, but not as rough as rough. And we have hot press, which, let's see if I can get that. Hopefully you don't see any texture when I show you the hot press because it is completely smooth. Mm yeah uh very very smooth and we'll get into the reasons why how it's able to be so smooth uh and then we have one that is unique to fabriano and that is our soft press surface and soft press is just a, a beautiful surface texture that's right in between cold press and rough uh so you can get a lot of the the detail you'd expect or cold press. It's a cold press and hot press. press. And cold yeah. press. Uh, so you get a lot of the detail you'd expect from a hot press uh, without some of the blooming and pooling, but you can also get some of the, the capacity to hold those granular pigments like a right. cold press. Uh, right. So, so four surfaces, hot press, very smooth. Cold press is a medium tooth. Soft press is a soft tooth. And then rough is a rough tooth. So you have a whole spectrum of things you can play with there. We have the two colors, remember, We've got the extra white and the traditional white. So you can, if you're working in a, let's say you're an illustrator doing digital reproduction, then the extra white would be ideal because you scan it and you don't get any of that right. softness from the paper. Uh, or if you are a landscape painter and you want to have a little bit of earthiness, then that traditional white might be for you. Uh, in addition to that, we've got all of the different weights. So there's 90 pounds, which is, if you see it in the packaging, it might say 200 GSM, that's right. per square meter. Uh, we have 140 pound, this is where it gets a little confusing. 140 pound is 300 grams. Then we have 300 pound, which is 640 grams. So if you see 300, make sure that you're looking at whether it says 300 pound or 300 grams. Uh, because 
it's about twice the price to get the, the 300 pound versus the 300 right. grams. Uh, so with that, I think we've covered the, the general selection of papers, the, the look of them, but there's a lot of different sizes as well. Right. And with that, we, we have the 22 by 30, that's your standard size. And all of these come in 22 by 30, whether you're getting in the 90 pound, the 140 pound, the 300 pound, the extra white, the traditional white. But we've also got it, as I said, in the rolls or in blocks. See, there's big glares in there. there yeah, now we can see it. Yeah, perfect. All right. And blocks. Now I might switch cameras. It might be a little easier, huh? Yeah, probably so. All right, let's try this. Now, as you're as you're going to you're switching those cameras, um, yeah. that's something that people always ask because they don't understand when you're talking about the weight of a paper, you're talking about what a ream of the paper, a hundred sheets, is for the actual weight, correct? So that's, that where they, is, that's where they extrapolate that weight from. It's not because people will be like, I don't want paper that heavy. And it's like, it's not, it's not that heavy. It's exactly. what sheets of that size, you know, would weigh. Yes. They put it a certain size, which is that 22 by 30. They put it on a scale. And then for that number of sheets, it will weigh that amount. Right. Uh, so the same number of sheets in 140 pound. Uh, right weigh 140 pounds and if you put 300 pounds it's going to weigh 300 pounds right so that's what the magic of that is it's not it's any anything other than that it just it just means that it's kind of that less that thinner less paper per the same number yes that and way. just just to make sure that we're clear that translates very well for watercolor paper but not for a lot of other paper right i think that you can you can get 140 pound watercolor paper and it's going to be the same weight as 140 pound printer paper it's, it's right uh, there's a big not the same thing yeah because uh, they're measured in different ways the sheet size is going to be different things like that right i just wanted to check because i knew i know that people ask and it's funny because after i asked that then that questions come up since i'm noticing on the on the chat so go ahead you go ahead and show show them the block and it so that they can see that and then absolutely and then i think you've got some really cool films I do. I have some little little videos I want I wanted to share. Uh, they've been around for for a little while, but they have some awesome awesome information. And of course, I shouldn't have taken the wrapper off beforehand because I want to show how a block works. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a block is, uh, don't don't be ashamed. They are all of us at one point or another picked up a block and said. This pad is weird. <laughs> and it's because it is it is a weird pad. So this, for instance, is a cold press, uh, extra white, 140 pound or 300 gram uh, cold press surface. And you'll see that it's got a really nice nine by 12 surface there. But just like any, any other pad, you go to flip it and you get your little flip book effect. With this, you don't. It's a solid, solid, uh, a solid brick. I mean, a, a block of paper. It's a brick. So it. Some people might even perceive it as, oh, I just spent all that money, and there's only one thing in here. It's like a canvas, but it's not quite like that. So I'm gonna get some paint on this just so we can tell the difference between this and the sheet below. So ideally you you paint on the surface and after you're done painting on the surface, you'd let it dry. The reason you do that is if you're ever painting on the surface, you'll, you'll notice it'll get a little bubbly sometimes on some papers. And when that happens, if you let it dry like that, uh, just like your, your clothes or anything around the house, if you let it dry like that, it keeps that form. Now, if it's on the block, you, you paint on it and you might see a little bubble, but uh, as it's drying, the sealed edge around there that we looked at, that's gonna pull it tight like a drum. 
So you, you paint on the block without taking the sheet off. You let it dry on the block without taking the sheet off. And then when you're all done, you'll take your, your handy dandy letter opener, or palette knife or, or knife. And on Fabriano, it's on the corner here, there's a little pocket and you just go right around the edge. And after you've done that, make sure I don't cut the paper here. After you've done that, you take it off and it'll be dried flat, ready to frame. Won't have any wobble in the frame because it dried perfectly flat. And then you have a nice clean sheet of paper underneath to start your next painting on. Uh, so if you want to be working on multiple paintings at one time and you really love blocks, I suggest having yeah. multiple You're blocks have to have multiple opposed blocks. to trying to take your sheets off. <laughs> yep. Uh, definitely. So Amy, do you think it's it's time we should take a look at a video? I I think so. It's if all right. So I'll get, I'll give us a little. A, the, I just want to make the point that we are looking at the Artistico paper, which is a hundred percent cotton. So we're looking going to be talking about real artist papers, which are the handmade cotton that we're doing here. The, these aren't paper pulp papers that we're talking about. The process that you're going to show us is going to be with the cotton rag. Very true. So there are actually three ways to make paper. Uh, we'll be looking at videos for two of those ways. The first way that we're not going to look in it as much is machine made and machine made paper will often take cellulose pulp, which uh, a lot of us will say is tree pulp, but it's not necessarily from trees. It could be byproducts from corn or any other cellulose based product. And they take that and they basically turn it into a cellulose powder, mix it with glue, run it through a machine that turns it into sheets of paper. Uh, that's how we get things like our office paper or less expensive drawing papers or sketching papers, things that we, we probably don't want to spend a lot of money investing in in order to save. Uh, and that it's a very, very automated process, goes through a machine pretty quickly uh, so they can make a ton of paper at once. The next process uh, is a big step up from there. It's called mold made. And that is where I will share this screen with you, Amy. And we'll take a look at the mold made process. And mold made is very close uh, to a handmade product without the price tag of a handmade product because they are able to, uh, to use a little bit of machinery. It's very, very involved, very, there's a lot of hand work that goes into it. Uh, a lot of, of human interaction throughout the whole process. Uh, if you see any typos in here, uh, forgive us. There's some, some uh, translation that got lost from the Italian to the English. But you can see here these big bags and uh, uh, bulk bins of cotton. They take the cotton and they add it to the pulper. And the pulper uh, is mixed with water and it will basically turn your paper into something that's moldable. Uh, refining it. And then they have the refined pulp that they'll, they'll, uh, they'll run through and they'll add sizing to it. And the sizing is a glue that holds your paper together, uh, essentially making it super durable. So that between the cotton, which has long strands and the sizing, you have a really, really durable surface. And this, uh, this sizing is called internal sizing, correct? This is, it is indeed the, the internal. internal sizing. Okay. And then it goes along that screen and uh, the screen is where we add in the watermark. And then from there, uh, it goes through this vat. And the vat will, will push it out onto these, uh, these felt, felt conveyors. They will pull it out of there. And the felt conveyors are where we add the surface texture. So for instance, cold press is gonna have a different surface texture than your rough, the rough is gonna have a felt blanket that has a much more rough surface. Uh, and as it's, as it's pushing along there, that dictates the surface texture on both sides. So you'll get a similar surface. You know, Every blanket can be a little different. So you might have a slightly different uh, surface on one side than the other, but they're gonna be very close. We, we, I'm talking too much. So we went through the vat, which is where it's vat sized or tub sized. I'll try and catch up. Uh, 
And that is, I'll pause it for a second. Oh, actually, we're going to talk about it here. So it went through the first drying process, which is good. So they, they bring it out on those conveyors. They squish all the water out of it. Uh, and then they push it through this surface sizing vet. Now the surface sizing is, I'll let it play again. Uh, the surface sizing is that same kind of glue. This is a, in the case of the new paper, it's that starch based sizing, uh, which is really beautiful. They push it through there and it coats both sides of the paper as it moves through, through that vet. Uh, now, when it comes out, both sides are coated evenly. So you could paint on either side of that paper. Uh, it's just gonna have a slightly different tooth to it. Then it'll go through the dryer again, which in talking about the dryer, Amy and I talked a little bit about it earlier, how cool it is. Uh, it's actually, in the case of Fabriano, it's these big drums. And Amy, do you remember what, how, how, that, how that worked, what those were? No, because I was so excited. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Okay, so the, the big drums uh, are, are using uh, water or steam from Fabriano's own power plant. So Fabriano is all hydropowered. And then that steam is a byproduct and they fill those drums with the steam and it gets very, very hot as you can imagine. And then as the paper rolls over the drums, the heat from the steam inside on that steel drum is, is drying the paper. Uh, so we are very excited by how environmentally friendly Fabriano is using the same hydropower to process a lot of different portions of the, of the mill. Uh, so you'll see, you'll see all over the place. I mean, there's, in the next video we'll watch, you'll see some water being used, but because of the way they process everything and use that hydropower, uh, it, it's very, very, very little waste goes into this uh, and the clean water ends up going back into the environment uh, as it should. So now they create, this is a master roll and it is just humongous. It's so much paper on that roll and they take that roll and that's where they, they take it off onto the smaller rolls like the one behind me uh, or into the sheets. Now it'll be a little different now that we're having four deckled edges, but it's essentially the same process for all of them. So if you get cold press in a block or in a, uh, in a, in a block, in a sheet, in a roll, you're getting the exact same paper, uh, no matter what source it is. Uh, they make it in the same way. It's all coming off of that mold made machine, uh, which is not a machine at all, as you saw. It's, it's quite antiquated. There's very, it's very specialized. They have to have engineers on site to be able to handle oh, anything. Pet. You can't just go out and order bolts for it. It's all custom made stuff. Uh, what do you think, Amy? How, how, how do we do? Did, did we cover all of the, the mold made processes there? Yeah, I think definitely so. So I think that that's, that's great because that gives people a better idea of, I mean, if you've owned Fabriano, your paper went through that machine. Yep. I mean, that's, that's just really cool. Yeah. So I, I skipped over the calendaring a little bit, but the calendaring is when you get something like a hot press, it's what you, it pushes it through to get that really smooth surface. Uh, but that's the biggest difference. All the papers, except for the hot press, they get that textured blanket surface and the hot press goes through the calendaring process. Uh, but essentially all the papers are made in the same way uh, on that mold made machine. And the mold made, the, the mold paper maker that they use uh, happens to also be the same way that they make their currency. So Fabriano, I think we talked about it a little bit in the last show. Uh, Fabriano is very well known for making banknotes for all over the world. So, you know, the Euro note, uh, they make the paper for that. And then of course it goes to a special place to be printed. So they don't print money, but they make the paper that it's printed on. That's crazy. And then we, we get a lot of people who say, well, I, I like handmade paper. I want handmade paper. Now, uh, the biggest difference between mold made and handmade is the price tag. Uh, handmade paper is, if it's made right, if it's made well, it's, it's not cheap. Uh, and Fabriano does make some handmade papers. Uh, and I'll show you a little video on how those are made and you'll see why it's a little more expensive. And 
And I am sharing that video with you right now. Do you see it? Yes, it's going. All right. So again, with, with the new uh, Fabriano Artistico, it's, it's just, it's got that phenomenal new starch sizing. Uh, whereas the handmade paper that Fabriano makes is still using a very traditional method of, of animal-based sizing in order to keep with that handmade tradition. Uh, it takes about six people to make a given sheet of handmade paper. Uh, like right there, you saw him take a little scoop out. He was just quality che checking everything, making sure it's the right consistency. Uh, these mesh screens are all created by hand. They're hand woven. Uh, that watermark, that's the Roma watermark. Those are all hand woven by artisans. In fact, in Fabriano, they have a, in the town of Fabriano in Italy, they have a watermark museum where every year they create a new watermark and they add it to this museum and it's backlit and it's, it looks beautiful. I've never been, but one of these days I'll check it out. We're, we're going to have to do that, Andrew. I'm telling we you. Our field trip. Yep. Now this, it looks somewhat easy, but getting the right consistency on every sheet is very difficult. Uh, and having to lift that out of the water all day long, uh, it takes some kind of strength. I don't think I would be able to do it all day. Uh, and then there, they're putting it, each sheet goes onto its own felt in order to sit and, and dry and not stick to the next sheet. That's just amazing that he can get that consistency with just that quick dip, you know? Yep. Oh, and then the hydraulic press. This is part, Amy, that we were looking at last time. Yeah. We When we were checking out the video, making sure that it was appropriate for the air. That's right. <laughs> This was it was really impressive. I, I was delighted to see it. That's just crazy how much moisture that's getting out of that. It, yep. I wouldn't want to get my foot caught in that. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> now, this is where they're doing all the quality checking, too, as they go. Every single part of the process, they, they do a lot of quality checking. Oh, and this, this was your favorite part, Amy. Yes. Look at that, how they're doing the by hand watermark. Now you'll notice in that diagram that shows the whole process, it's a much shorter process than in the, uh, in the mold made, in the handmade, you don't, the paper doesn't have to travel as far, but it does, it does still have, uh, have a lot more hands to go through in that short distance. Oh, who do we have? We, we have, we have a, a, a special guest sneaking in who is, uh, is <laughs> shoulder at the, at the handmade paper. Bonjour. <laughs> Hello. Bonjour, Amy. Bonjour, everybody. Bonjour, Pierre. Just sneaking in just to say hi. Hopefully, okay. I'll be able to come another time. But I just wanted to say one thing because I've been there. This is a place I've been in Fabriano. And I just want to leave you with a, a thought. In 1264, in the middle of the Middle Age, Fabriano, a little town of 20,000 people, or 10,000 people at the time, I don't know, was like the Silicon Valley of the Middle Age. Imagine where paper was invited, invented and how it changed the world. Right. Love letter to politics, to religions, to business, to art, to literature, to everything so and what you see on the photo the first video did you show the handmade video this is the handmade 
the handmade video, oh yeah, that's when they're drying and all that. This video, that's exactly, exactly, exactly at the same place where and how they made paper 755 years ago. So today, I believe we are the only place, the only company Fabriano can make the Geoline paper the way it was made at that time. So on that note, go paint! <laughs> oh my God, Amy, looking good. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I was, I, I forgot my mask. <laughs> I cannot be so close, so close to Andrew without my mask. That would be worried. You won't listen to me. Are oh, you looking good, Emmy? It's good to see you, Pierre. She has a new haircut. All right. Uh, so that for those of you who who have not met Pierre or watched Pierre's Art Ventures, uh, that is the Pierre who I mentioned earlier today. Uh, he is as he started Savoir Faire. Uh, in 1980, so almost 40 years ago, and uh, and he has had the passion to to bring all of these brands into the U.S. Uh, and Canada, the whole uh, America, ever since. Uh, so it's his fault that we that we have Fabriano here in front of us to talk about. Uh, he just came on too because he knows that I love his French accent, <laughs> and it, it always it's, makes it, me blushy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's he's listening, so now he knows that he made you blush. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, looking good. I'm so happy that we are here with your community, Amy. That's very nice to invite us to your live. And uh, you. hopefully it would be the beginning of a series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll let you go because stuff. otherwise I'm going to talk too much. So, okay. oh. All right. So now we got to look at how the mold made paper and the handmade yeah. papers are made. We talked a lot about them. Now, one thing I didn't mention is the blocks. So we, we talked a little bit about how a block is made mm -hmm. special, but what I didn't talk about is the exciting new things coming in blocks. So the Fabriano blocks are also gonna be the brand new paper with the brand new sizing, uh, new and improved formula. So perfection of perfection. Uh, so as soon as that happens, not only will we have the five by seven, the, where did I put it in front of me? The nine by 12, uh -huh. the 12 by 18, and the 14 by 20. Okay. The 18 by 24, which is too big for me to have at the table. <laughs> uh, but we are really excited to be launching three new sizes because us American artists were asking for them. Good. So three new sizes solely for us. Uh, that's gonna be the seven by 10 size, the 10 by 14 size, and the 12 by 16 size. Nice. So those, those have been the most popular requests for block sizes uh, in the last many years. And we're really excited to be bringing those in all of the surfaces. Now, so with the new sizing that they're doing, is everything going to still be under the the same aquarello name or is this going to be a line that's going to be separate no this will still be the the okay. Fabriano artistico okay and, and on the on the blocks themselves sorry i got i gotta make sure the, the lighting is right here let me switch cameras um on the blocks themselves it says aquarello and a lot of people think that's the brand name but it's right. actually think that it's uh, more so put on there because across the world, Aquarello is, is identified as a watercolor paper. Right. Uh, whereas the Artistico is the actual. That's, yeah, yeah, that's paper. my bad. Uh, but we do often get people requesting Aquarello and we, we have to make sure that they want the Artistico because there's a lot of different types of Aquarello. That's exciting. Very, very exciting. Uh, so are we gonna are we gonna get to see a sample of this new paper and how it works? Yes, absolutely. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure you guys can't see my notes. <laughs> see the camera panned out again on me, Amy. It did. Isn't that weird? All right. So we talked about all the sizes. Got to make sure I got everything off my notes. There, we got the new blocks, the new paper 
just could not be more thrilled about that. Uh, and you will be expecting to see those in Jerry's sometime in the next couple months. It will be nice. in your stores on the website, the new paper, the new block sizes. Uh, the other thing that you're going to be seeing at Jerry's is the new packs. So we have the cold press extra white is going to be coming in the three plus one. Okay. Which is, a, uh, is a pack of three sheets and you get one extra sheet for free. Nice. And brand new, we will have the 10 plus four. So you'll have 10 sheets and you get four extra sheets for free. That's pretty so nice. The, the pack value on those is going to just be phenomenal. You guys yeah. miss it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that as soon as Jerry's gets them, they're going to sell out and we'll have to get them more. So, uh, but let's take a look at the paper surfaces. We'll play, we'll play with some, some stuff on the paper so you guys can see how it all works. Now I've got, I've got here in front of me, if, if the lighting is right, it looks a little off. We'll fix that. Uh, so I've got five different sheets of paper here in front of me. Okay. And I'm going to move that out of my way. And on these five sheets of paper, I'll tell you exactly what I have. I have the brand new paper with the, the this one is two decals because I cut it, uh, but normally it'd be the full sheet with four decals. And that is 140 pound cold press. I have got 90 pound hot press. And this is the existing paper, so still phenomenal paper. I also have a 300 pound sheet of our soft press surface. Okay. I have a 140 pound sheet of our current cold press surface. I'll put that right next to that so we can play with them together. And then I have 300 pound sheet of our rough surface. Oh, nice. Now, for me to start playing, I think I need to pick a color. Amy, do you have a color suggestion for me? Oh, what colors were, were it? Hmm. Here, so so the, we picked some special colors for the show. Yes. And I'll, I'll let you choose from those. So okay. some of my favorites that are a little underrated. I Not remember Generous Blue was one because of them. Because nobody knows about them yet. Yeah. Uh, greenish Umber. Yeah. You can say the other ones, but that's going to be the one I'm going to want. <laughs> <laughs> Permanent Alizarin Crimson yeah, Deep. That's nice too. Which a lot of people don't know. It's got a long, It's the, the name is a mouthful, Permanent Alizarin Crimson Deep. Uh, but that's actually a pure quinacridone burnt scarlet pigment. Mm-hmm. I have Yellow Sophie. That's beautiful too. I'll talk a little bit about Sennelier and I'll tell you where that name came from. I have got Cineris Blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's Sophie Sennelier. <laughs> and I have got Turquoise Green. You know what? I, I'm going to say the either the Greenish Umber or the Alizarin uh, permanent deep because those are those are my two favorite I'll, i like all of those but i there's something about both of those i use those both in almost everything i do so okay then we'll use them both yeah they look nice together too do they i haven't used them together yeah well just they're very they're just really nice and you know i i know that um well, you know that I work with uh, with the Sennelier watercolors, but hot press is my jam because I can do ink work on it and then do watercolor over it, and the ink doesn't skip when I do drawings. So yes. Now, have you have you played with the soft press much? Um, you know, I, I've not. I guess I just because it doesn't. I use blocks typically. Oh, I think and it does not come in the blocks. Yeah, that's been the issue. I but I should we understand. But yes, it is. Uh, if you if you've seen the work of Lauren McCracken, he's a good friend of ours. His work is just photorealistic. He gets yeah. sharp edges. 
uh, he does he does stuff in kind of the uh, the Dutch or Flemish tradition. It's right. a lot of crystal and silver, uh, beautiful, beautiful paintings. And all that's on soft press. He works only on three hundred pounds soft press. Wow, I would have I would have expected that to be hot press just because it's so smooth looking. Now, so what brushes are you using as, with that as Ooh, well? Those well, are really pretty. <laughs> all right, so uh, we will talk a little bit about the brushes and the paints. Uh, I'll skip over the history for the moment. We can dive into that, or you can ask me questions as we go. Uh, but the brushes I'm working with right now are a brand new set from Raphael called Le Voyager. Uh, and it, once you get it out of this box, you get a nice little leather folio that pops open. And of course, there's nothing in it right now because I'm holding the brush in my hand. Right. But these brushes. Yeah, these they're nice little travel brushes. I like that there's a quill in it, that it's not just all, you know, rounds or something. There's a quill. There is. And it, the quill in there is our soft aqua quill. Mm -hmm. Synthetic squirrel brush. And as I think, I think we've talked about before, synthetic squirrels are just so much easier to catch. <laughs> uh, they. <laughs> you have not said that before because that's, I would have remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it's, it's so true though. It, <laughs> they, they virtually walk right into the. the right. Uh, so the, the soft aqua, it's actually a, a fiber that, that Raphael made from scratch that has uh, wavy fibers. Mm -hmm. The wavy fibers allow for it to just have a really, really awesome water holding capacity. So you can get almost as much water, if not as much water, which means pigment, as the, the natural squirrel brush. But as those of us who have had to buy natural squirrel brushes in the mm -hmm. know, natural squirrel can be a little cost prohibitive. Right. Because they're harder to catch. Now, <laughs> this, was, this was a really, in, I love the way that you've laid this out where we can see all of those five types of paper together because look at, you can really, especially the rough, you can see it, the way that the color deposits, the pigment deposits right down in there. That's really awesome. Yeah, so the, the rough, of course, has bigger divots. So the pigment just kind of settles into those divots. Uh, and then here we have the soft press. Uh, so you can see it's got, yeah. got just a very subtle laid pattern from that felt. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can see it from that distance. Uh, once it's dried a little bit, I'll hold them up so you can look. The soft press, you can see it's drying in the middle here very smooth. But then around the edges, like I had talked about, uh, for those people who want to paint a little more loose on, on the hot press, it, it has a tendency to want to bloom around the edges or pool as, as an even wash is, is, it takes a little more skill to achieve an even wash, right. uh, depending on your technique. So you'll see it's smooth in the middle and then pooling up around those edges, which is where the soft press uh, has an advantage because It'll, it'll give you that smoother wash effect, but you don't get that same blooming effect. That's a good point. Uh, and then, of course, we have the current cold press paper and the new cold press paper. Nice. And I don't know about you, but I see a, a very little difference in the way the paint is, is drying on the surface as it's starting to dry over here and over here. Uh, the edges are grabbing that nice dark line from where I got a little washy in the same kinds of ways. So from, from an actual tactile standpoint, there's not a tremendous amount of difference, but from, from the perspective of uh, you know, environmental impact, we're using a single source right. starch, a potato starch maybe even, uh, and it's very, very environmentally friendly, vegan friendly, there's no animal product in any of these papers. Uh, and we maintain that with the new sizing, pure cotton, 
uh, and then that that starch. I mean, it's it's they're virtually indistinguishable from from here, you know, through a screen. It, it, I would love if I, it was I could see it in person, but it's, we'll make that. Happen. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. It's just you know, but but I I love it. The color is still just as vibrant. It it sits on the paper, you know, just as nicely. This is a really great way to to show. Okay, it's like you've done this before. It, it, it's like I have. What? Somebody you, said dad joke see, about I'm the squirrel, really good, the synthetic squirrel. I'm really good at hiding the terror that I have right now <laughs> from being in front of so many people. <laughs> but but that's okay. I'll curl up in the corner later. <laughs> um, why are you laughing? Uh, no. <laughs> the, yeah. The, so the, the biggest difference from, from an actual, from a standpoint of an artist is just going to be knowing that that sizing has changed and looking at the luminosity on the surface of the paper, the, the right. brightness of, of it. Yeah. Um, and, and it'll depend on which color. So we'll try, we'll try this bright, brighter color, of course, the quinacridone burnt scarlet or the uh, alizarin crimson permanent deep. That must be why I love it so much because I'm kind of a quinacridone junkie. Yeah. And I just, I never looked. To You're see hooked on quack? Huh? I, I like to, the quinacridone is hard to pronounce. So some people call it quin or quack. It's quack, hooked on quack. The <laughs> quack, nice. Uh, so the brighter, and we'll have to wait for it to start to dry for us, but I have a feeling that we'll have some really nice luminosity on the new paper, uh, plus that four deckled edges and that mm -hmm. new. So for those of you, who have used Fabriano before, you'll know that along the entire edge, we had a watermark that ran. Uh, now, let's see, is it this sheet? It is this sheet. Let's see, I'm gonna use my, my handy dandy iPhone, to try and show you guys the watermark. Can you guys see that at all? No? Um, pull it back towards you just a little bit We're out of the camera range. There we go. Anything? Kind of, yeah. Ah, we'll quit trying. Uh, close enough, but the watermark now, uh, so I'll, I'll look at it and I'll show you how big it is. So right now it says Artistico right there. Mm -hmm. And then Fabriano right there. Okay. Next watermark right there on the corner. Uh, so you no longer have something that's going to run across the entire edge. Right. That's just great. on the corner. You know, after after we're done, take a photo of it with your um, phone and text it to me, and I'll put it in the Jerry's Live group. Oh, fantastic! So they can see what it looks like. That'll work. Perfect. Now, so the the paint that we're playing with on this new Fabriano paper uh, is, of course, Sennelier. For those of you who are not familiar with Sennelier, I'm sorry. It is. Uh, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal paint. Uh, Sennelier was started in the 1880s in Paris with the Sennelier store. Uh, Gustave Sennelier had taken the store over and it was an art store and he, he maintained it as an art store and started making his own paint uh, in the back room, just like, a, like, a, uh, like we would go to the pharmacy, people would go in and order, order paints. Uh, it would go into these these little bladders and they could take it home and have just their, you know, one gram of cerulean blue or six grams of titanium white, but titanium was just, just coming about. Uh, so sit more likely six grams of zinc white or lead white. Uh, and one of the first paints he started making was watercolor for the French Impressionists because they wanted something that would travel easy that they could have on site with them anywhere they went. Uh, and we maintain that tradition now with 98 colors in the range. Uh, just, just beautiful, beautiful colors. Uh, full spectrum, but inspired by the French Impressionists. Mm -hmm. Let me see where I hit it. It's right here in front of me. So here is the color range. And you'll see that just looking at it, you see all those blues and greens and you just know that it's inspired by that French. Yes, definitely. And the yellows too, I think. 
Absolutely. Uh, so Sennelier paint is very special for a number of reasons, but the first and foremost is that not only does it have really pure gum Arabic uh, from Sudan and really pure pigment sourced from all over the world, but it's also got honey. Did you know that, Amy? I did. You did. Do you know where honey comes from? I'm, well, you know, judging from the color chart and the little, um, the little beehive kind of, I love how they took the color chart and all the colors are in that little hexagon for the bees. That's so adorable. So the, the honey is- oh, they have, or, Don't they have their own bees? I they do see. have their own bees. Yeah, yeah. They are, they are right there at the factory. There are 12 beehives on the factory premises. Oh, wow. In Brittany, France, not far from Paris where they started. They had to expand beyond their little store to make the paint. Uh, but we get that honey and the honey does a couple of really cool things. Uh, now I'll quiz Amy again. Amy, do you remember one, one of the things that the honey does? Well, okay. so. Uh, somebody brought this up the last time and they were like, well, everybody uses honey. Well, most, most manufacturers use a little bit of honey because it's better than adding um, other chemical preservatives to the paint to keep it from going bad in the tube. That's Absolutely. not, I know that that's not why, I mean, that's, it's a, that's a great beneficial reason why Sennelier adds it, but that's not why. It's one of the, yeah, one of the top three reasons why is that it's a natural preservative. So there doesn't have to be any chemical stabilizers. Uh, you know, a lot of paints uh, now use things like glycerin and having the honey prevents us from having to, to use those things. Uh, the other thing that it does that I think is really, really fun is that it's a natural, uh, it's, it is hydroscopic is the word. I right. Know. And so it absorbs moisture from the atmosphere, uh, allowing it to re-wet just super easily. So we can get our handy dandy, yep, that's right. handy dandy Aqua Mini, this nice little pocket set that Sennelia makes. And I have not used, well, I used the red earlier today, I'll admit that. So I won't use red right now when I show you how well it re-wets. Uh, so we'll use, there's ultramarine blue, French ultramarine blue here in the corner. And just a quick little, little dab with a wet brush. And I immediately have color. So the honey just lets that color lift right out of there without having to scrub at it or hurt your, your nice brushes. Just touch and go. Well, and, and I'll go even further to say that, you know, how how making your own travel set with two watercolors, sometimes even though you've allowed them to dry, you really have to scrub at them after they've actually fully dried or they crack and fall out of the out of the container. I've got the wood box set of the Sennelier watercolors and I made a travel set out of three different like 33 wells. And that stuff lights up immediately as soon as you touch it with, with water. It's just, it's amazing from uh, other brands that I've, you know, had in the past, the, how, how easily you can pull the color back up. Just, just like that. I mean, and I know, I know that pans are designed to be able to do that because that's kind of one of the downfalls sometimes of pans, but, but for that tube to be able to just um, re-wet that quickly is just really nice. Absolutely, especially in those earth tones. Earth tones are notorious for being difficult yes, to get out. So, so, you know, I brought, I, I, I have to admit this too. So this set uh, is not my work set. It's a Sennelier set of 48. This belongs to my wife and she let me take it. She was really, I hope she made you sign a note or something. Uh, no, no, no she, it was, it was. Uh, see, she, she, we lost this pan right here at some point. So I, I promised that I'd replace that pan. Mm -hmm. I was able to borrow it today. Nice. So I'm going to do. Uh, remind me at the end that I have to do that. <laughs> okay. <I'll> uh, <laughs> afterwards. 
Don't forget. <laughs> but this is my wife's set, so I can't be too too uh, messy or, or hurt it at all. Uh, but let's pick an earth tone, and we'll do that same practice where yeah. I have a wet brush, and I haven't used this set at all today. And which 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 one do you want? Ah. Uh... I don't, right there. So, yes. <laughs> oh, do you know what that is that you picked? Um, I've got a pretty good idea. If, it's not even on our list because it was on the list last year. So, yeah, it was on the list last year, wasn't it? I think so. So I'm guessing that's what it that it's what it is. It, it is absolutely. Amy has an eye for this. This is this this pan right here is called Caput Mortem. And Kaput Mortem is a violet oxide color yep. that, uh, that is named after death, of course. Hence Kaput Mortem. Look at that. You saw how quick that oh color just pulled right out of there. And yeah. it's a very opaque color at that. Uh, yeah. It's a, vi a violet oxide. And the reason that, that uh, I like this color is because it's, it's modeled after the traditional mummy color. But to me, but to me, it's more violety than most people's rendition of it. You know, it is. It is. It's it's just I nice love violet. that violet undertone, and it mixes yeah. a little more violet too. Even though it's a, you know, just a yeah. iron oxide violet. So if we were to take something like a blue, like this scenarius blue here, which is on our list this time, uh -huh. and we mix that in there. You get these nice deep violety tones. I think last time even somebody was asking me if Sennelier made a Potter's Pink, and we we explained how Caput Mortem worked really well as a Potter's Pink substance. Mm -hmm. so you can thin That's it right. out to that same kind of tone. Yes, if they've not seen that episode, we did that last year. It was the last episode of last year, so they should go back and watch it in the. Uh, in the files at the at the beginning of each show there's always a there's a there's those notes and a link you can pull up the entire list of the shows and you can see the show with andrew from last year which was really awesome it was a tremendous amount of fun and we got to be in the studio together which i, I know do very soon uh so i got to play with her set a little bit to show you guys nice really even the earth tones re-wet uh Sennelier is just a beautiful brilliant color Raphael, I didn't talk about the history of these brushes at all. So I told you that the squirrels are easy to catch because they're synthetic. Then we also, in this, in this grouping, the La Voyager set that we have, there is one more of the soft aqua brushes. Oh, nice. Synthetic squirrel, and it's a round, this one here. Let's see, yeah. one here. And then there's also a precision, or I'll hold it. Let, let me let me flip cameras. Yeah, real. that might be easier to see. Switch camera. There we go. The precision are the um, are they the synthetic Kalinsky? They okay. are the synthetic Kalinsky. So the precision has a really nice sharp point, great for doing nice. details. And then you'll see the round. This is the soft aqua. So this is a a round version of that synthetic squirrel. It's not not quite as sharp as the synthetic Kalinsky. The precision. Uh, but it's it holds a tremendous amount of water, so it's really good for laying down thicker lines, little areas. And then my personal favorite is the quill, because quills can get a really, really sharp point on them, but then you can lay them down and get a really broad area. It's almost like a wash brush that you can do detail with. It's fantastic. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, quills have become my, my ultimate favorite. Uh, I think I fell in love with quill brushes when I I saw a video of Eric Fischel doing these massive paintings with a quill brush. Uh, and I had no idea what they were back then. And since then I have fallen in love. Quill brushes are the thing uh, for all my watercolor needs. Yeah, right. But that's great. That's a good, that's a nice well-rounded set where you've got a lot of capacity in just three little brushes. Yep. And then of course they're travel friendly. They all pop right in. And then go into their little sleeve. Even the quill, it's a little scarier to put in here. But I know it makes me so nervous watching other people do that. 
I'm so afraid they're going to break the end. And then it's in its little container. It's got its little cell phone clip for your pocket. Oh, nice. Backpack or your purse. Uh, nice little strong clip on there. So that is a handy set. Now, another set that I brought with me of the Raphael brushes. This is just a little bamboo carrier for it. But it is these mini precisions. There's also a mini soft aqua quill, like the one we were looking at in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are just the size of a, of a, you know, makeup brush. They have the beveled end on them. Oh, nice. The scraper chip. Scrape back into your paintings. Wow. It even comes in a filbert. So now I'll flip cameras again and we can look at this. So I'll set my, my wife's lovely set aside so I don't. I've got somebody that's videos. asking while you're, while you're getting those out to show yeah. if the soft press will ever come in a block or a sample pack. Do you know if they maybe plan to do that? I would love that. And I, I, I know it's been a topic of discussion. Uh, as of yet, I have not seen samples of that, but feel free to continue sending us emails, uh, asking us for it, and we will, we'll make sure that it gets on our list. And the feedback. Okay, good. So yes, uh, you can find us on Facebook or on Instagram at Art Savoir Faire. Uh, shoot us a message on there. Uh, that way we have, we have a source. We can get back to you. We can look into it and let you know if and when that can happen. But I would love to have soft press and blocks as well. So I'm right there with you. Yes, that would be wonderful. Well, and they should they should check you guys out on Instagram to follow some of the great interviews Pierre has been doing. Yes, uh, because those those he's talked to some very timely and important artists as of late. Um, we had we had a really good interview. Great. Yes, with Dean Mitchell, the watercolorist I mentioned yeah. earlier. Uh, Valerie Collymore. Uh, this upcoming Friday, we have uh, Kiko Tanabe on there, a, a phenomenal watercolorist. Yeah. And she will probably talk a little bit about Sennelier watercolors as well. Uh, but you'll see the Raphael, we have this, this tiny little brush, pocket friendly. And it's still very reasonable to paint with. Oh, that's nice. And then using the back end, you can scratch back into your painting. So a lot of people use this to make you know, tree branches or I'm more of an abstract painter. So I just like it for, for the sake of making little marks. It's a nice little brush. It, it actually holds a lot of uh, fluid for being a small filbert. It does it, for being, yeah, a nice little, little tiny guy. Yeah. Still got paint in there. Uh, now let me make make sure I've, I've set my notes down as we've gotten into our conversations, Amy, and I, I don't want to miss anything. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> I know we're I know we're getting close to the end, but please make sure that you covered everything that you needed to. Need to? I'm hanging out with you. That's all I need to do. You no, know, AOC better go this year, man. Yes. So we get to hang out. I know it. I mean, I'm excited. I'm hoping that, that everything's back up and running. We'll be back on planes soon. Uh, so I told all of you guys about Fabriano paper. Uh, hopefully you're as excited as I am about the new papers, the new blocks, uh, the new sizing, the new watermark, yeah. the new edges. Uh, all of it is 100% cotton. Uh, no bleaches, no optical whiteners. New and improved starch-based sizing. Hydropower manufacturing. Uh, so very environmentally friendly over there in Fabriano where, we're, you know, as we talked about, even the, the process for drying the paper. Yeah, that's amazing. Water. Uh, so it is, it is really exciting stuff. Uh, we got to talk a little bit about the Sennelier paints. So hopefully you're, you're as excited about that honey as I am. The 98 colors. Let's see. We still have some colors we can play with while I'm uh, making sure I cover all my notes. So one of my favorites is this turquoise green. Uh, it is kind of a perennial favorite. Everybody likes it. 
multiple people have asked, do you guys sell the Fabriano shirts at all? And if you don't yet, you probably need to consider it because <laughs> everybody always asks every time I'm around you. We, we did, we did. And in fact, we sold out. So we will have to look into getting some more of those shirts. Uh, you, yeah, you need this to. One, this one is for, no, I'm just, <laughs> all paint covered. And... <laughs> Auction the shirt right off Andrew's back. <laughs> no don't say that because they'll go for it <laughs> <laughs> they, they really like the shirt <laughs> oh the money could go to a good cause right that's right that's true <laughs> uh yeah. no just joking just joking all right so i'm pulling up some of this turquoise green here which is just lovely bright color yeah, that would be beautiful for uh, for like uh, seascapes, tropical seascapes, you know, that's got that kind of lagoon color. You know, I, I always thought of it for that too, kind of putting it in that category. Yeah. Of, oh, tropical seascapes, uh, you know, vacation scenes, things like yeah. that. Uh, but then I saw some people who are portrait painters using it in really fascinating ways. Ooh. Also, when I was in New Mexico, I saw a lot of landscape painters using it for Southwest paintings because it bounced that orange. Right. Yeah. Soil like really well. Kind of cool shades, cool midday yep. shades or something. Yep. So very versatile color. Yeah. It's more versatile than I would have thought. I was very scared to use it because it's so intense. Uh, but now I've, it is very much so. Now I really enjoy it. And I put it next to this ultramarine blue so you can see. That's lovely color combination. Uh, so we talked about the Sinelli. One thing we didn't talk about was the history of Raphael. And I know I talked about it a little bit last time we were together, Amy. So I, I'll just briefly go over it because I know paper was our main focus today and we got to right. talk about Fabriano. Uh, but I am using the Raphael brushes. So I might right. tell you a little bit about those. So Raphael is Europe's oldest brush manufacturer for artists. Uh, prior to that, people had been using paint brushes that were made for house painting uh, or brushes that were made in Asia. There was a lot of calligraphy brushes and things like that. Uh, but about 220 years ago, a little more than that, uh, 220 years ago, Raphael started making brushes in Brittany, France. Uh, and they have been making them there ever since. Uh, and for the vast majority of that time, they've been uh, owned, operated, run by the same family, the Sauer family. Uh, Sauer family still runs it, still operates it, uh, very dedicated to quality. And the craftswomen who make all these brushes are dedicated to quality as well. Uh, I don't know why they are all craftswomen, but they are. That's just the way it's, it's been. Uh, traditionally, it's handed down from generation to generation a lot of times within the same families. Uh, and they are extremely skilled. Uh, in fact, the, the real Kalinske brushes that we had last time on the show, uh, they have to apprentice for about eight years before they can make those. Uh, and a lot of times they'll, they'll be apprenticing, making some of the synthetic brushes that I really, really love uh, while they're doing that just to get, get used to it. And they make sure that these brushes are perfect so that they can get into the, the next step of their brush making. Now, someone asked, um, how does turquoise green compare to emerald green? And I, I think it's one of those things where people need to remember to revert to looking at pigment numbers uh, because emerald green is a trade name. That's not something that's, it's not like titanium white where guess what? You know what pigment that is because it's titanium white, you know? Um, True. So I have an, ex I have an example here. We can, we can pop. Yeah, no, that would be, that's why I so, asked because I thought that might be a good thing. So yeah. just like you mentioned, emerald green is a trade name and every emerald, emerald green is, is made in a different formulation. So in the case of Sennelier, I really, really love our emerald green. Uh, it is, it's kind of a, a minty green. A lot of times emerald green can be a deep green made with viridian or phthalo. Right. But in this instance, it's kind of a, almost a tight knit green. 
Right. You'll see, you'll see that they both kind of border on that turquoise, but the, the emerald green is way over on the green yellow side. Yeah. And the turquoise is over here on the, the blue teal side. Right. Uh, even though it's called turquoise green, it's on the blue teal side of that. Which, which you would expect for turquoise. To me, when people say turquoise and then it's really more emerald, it's like, that's, that's not turquoise. Exactly. Uh, and in the case of Sennelia, again, this emerald is a mixed color mm -hmm. using phthalo green. Whereas the turquoise uh, is probably a, a higher series number. It is a series four because it's using cobalt. It's a cobalt turquoise green. It's a single pigment, whereas this one's a mixture, uh, which can, can, a lot of people think it can impact the, the muddiness you can get when you're painting, uh, but it all depends on how it's made. If you're mixing four colors on your own palette, you'll have a tendency to get some mud. Uh, if a company like Sennelier or any other company takes those same four pigments and mills it into a tube. Right. Because of the way they process it, it essentially becomes one pigment. Uh, so just because you see four pigments or three pigments or two pigments on the back of a tube doesn't necessarily mean it's going to create mud. Uh, it's more so on your own palette when you start mixing that number of pigments because you don't, we don't have the, the physical capacity we're not strong enough to mix the paint in the same way that, that they do when they're going through that three roll mill. Right. Well, and I think, I think just watercolor, there's two facets of that, that, that come into play to kind of back that up. One, one is that watercolor being a mostly transparent medium tends to not mud up as easily if it's a professional quality watercolor. And that's the other thing when you've got student grade or, you know, really just inexpensive kind of like, at a craft store to watercolors, there's a lot of fillers in them. So even if those are single pigments, they may get muddy quick because of those fillers that are included. Yes, just optically, uh, absolutely. Everything makes a, makes a difference. Now, what other colors should we play with, Amy? What uh on this on this beautiful new fabriano paper that what was the last color i know there times. was a color you haven't used that was one of the ones that you uh the two ones that you brought and you used the sofa yellow what what was the other you used the sinners blue right there was one was there one no color? i didn't use the sinners blue oh. oh no i did mix a little bit in but i didn't use it yes. pure, so oh yeah let's have a look at the sinners blue yeah sinners blue so Cenarius Blue is one of our, our favorite colors here at Savoir Faire and at Sennelier because you get this kind of a cerulean effect with it. Yeah. Uh, has a little more opacity than a cerulean, almost towards a manganese, but-, but Yes. What, now, so what's the name, anymore. what does the name hail from? I am not sure. I looked it up at one point uh, and now I'm, I'm blanking out. Bing bong, right? I know it. Uh, so I'll have to send that to you too, and we can we can have you post it. Okay. Uh, I want to say it's named after a type of mineral. That sounds like that would make sense. Uh, let me find out, and I'll get back to you. Okay. But that scenarius blue, we put yeah, it all, all right of now. our sets. The scenarius blue is even in the, the little aqua mini. Nice. This blue right here that is almost empty in mine. It is such a lovely color to play with. Well, Katie is threatening to cut us off because we're having too much fun and we've gone oh, an hour. We, I'm, I'm, thro I'm throwing her under the bus on it because you know that you and I could have this kid. It could be like nine o'clock and we'd still be playing. We could, we could. We could keep going forever. I know. We could test every color one of these days. I know. <laughs> We should do that sometime. Maybe we'll do, a, a, we'll do our own YouTube Zoom sometime. A, a, live, a, a live slumber party where we just test. Yeah, yes. I say we're, that's on. We need to do that. All right. We'll plan that. So, well, thank you so much for being here. I really, well, I mean, being, being there here, 
Um, well, thank you for having me. I, had and, a, a I mean, that time. was that, this has been great. And I think everybody's, A, they've learned a ton about paper. It makes so much more sense after watching that video. And it's one of those things where you can tell people the video exists, but will they find it? You brought it right up and showed it to us. And I think that that was, that was perfect. People much more appreciate the nature of how paper is made, even when it's, you know, not the guy actually doing it on the on the little screen that's it's really labor intensive there's a lot that goes into it and that was just that was it was great there's great history with it and i love that you brought out the three or the the five pieces where we could see everything plus the new sizing so that i can't wait till we get the new paper that's going to be great so thank Me you too right that. right now i only have it in this one style but i'm i'm excited to try it in everything and and uh We'll we'll see. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll get some acrylic paint on there, and yeah, all right. A lot to talk about. Well, thank you for showing it to us first. That was awesome. Everybody, thank you for looking at it first. Yeah, anytime. Well, um, if there's any products that you guys are curious about that he was showing us, again, the jerryzartorama.com website. Type in JL157. It will show the tube colors that he showed. Those cute little brush sets. It's got all the paper listed other than the new one because we don't have it yet. We're, we're waiting to get it in our hot little hands. Um, but we, we thank you. And I guess uh, we'll see everybody else next week. We have Royal Talons again, and they're going to be playing with soft pastels on a dark toned ground. This will be another fun Zoom chat. Um, and hopefully, Andrew, everything will be back to normal so we can have you in the studio um, this year at the end of the year again. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Take care. Everybody stay healthy and safe. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.